be a physicist, uh, approaching matter in particular, uh, professor and the director of something called the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. That's the, uh, what we call the Center of Excellence for Seafloor Mapping in the United States. And as of the last year or so, I've also been like, uh, like a dean, the director of a new school of marine science and ocean engineering. And I don't want to do that, so if anybody is looking for a job, <laughs> or you know somebody's looking for a job, please, but I really don't, I don't want to be doing that one. Um, my expertise, as I said, is in uh, seafloor mapping, in uh, interactive 3D data visualization. You'll see some examples of that. I also had another life years ago in uh, what we call paleoceanography, the history of climate in the ocean. So, so I have some of that expertise. But what I want to focus on uh, this week uh, is really just the geologic and geophysical aspects, particularly of Article behind Article 76. So this first lecture, what we're going to do is look at Article 76 from the perspective of a scientist, and then I'm going to step back and actually try to explain to you some of the, the science behind, behind what's an oceanic and what's continental and stuff like that. And then tomorrow we'll look at some of the approaches we take to filling the mandate of Article 76. We'll look at how we go about mapping the seafloor um, and other new aspects of, of, uh, of mapping going beyond just the seafloor. Actually, we're doing a lot of very interesting mapping in the water column too now, which has a lot of implications for fisheries and things like that. Um, and we have the Marine Science Workshop on Thursday, which I think you'll see touches on this, and this was without coordination, it's really quite amazing. Um, it touches on some of the things from Adam talked about this morning, and certainly some of the things that Professor Soon's talked about, so uh, hopefully it'll be, it'll be quite um, relevant. And I'll give you some instructions. I think you should all have already the questions for, uh, yeah. for the yeah. workshop. Yeah, good, okay, and I'll talk about that at the very end. Okay, let's get started and uh, look at Article 76. To me, it's just a remarkable article. It's just uh, 618 words, uh, but it provides this amazing nexus, that this connection between law and science. And it has all the ambiguities that the law has, and I have to admit that the science isn't so exact either. So it has the ambiguities of science, and so if you combine the ambiguities of law with the ambiguities of the science, you get super ambiguous stuff, and it'll keep you lawyers working for forever, and some of you scientists too. But what these words do is define a juridical, a legal continental shelf, and provides methods for a coastal state to establish the limits of that continental shelf. And within these limits, exercise sovereign rights over the resources of the seafloor and the subsurface. Okay, not the water problem like in the As I mentioned, it is just full of ambiguous terminology that lacks clarity and lacks definition. And most intriguingly, and this is what's so interesting but so frustrating too, it uses a lot of scientific terms in a legal context. And those legal meanings are different than the scientific meanings. And that's what I'm hopefully going to touch on a little bit today. Um, we also, and I think Fernanda mentioned this, have to realize that the treaty was mostly written through the 1970s, and we knew very, very little about the nature of the seafloor and seafloor processes in the 1970s. A few years later, in 1999, the CLCS, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, tried to produce a, a document called Scientific and, Scientific and Technical Guidelines that helped to try to clarify the interpretations it helped a little, but even in 1999, our understanding of the seafloor was still very limited. The real changes took place after that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And let me take a step back, too, and say that I tend to speak very fast, particularly when I get excited. And I'm always excited about this. So, you, you're, if I start going too fast, you just wave at me. So <laughs> slow down. I need that. And also, as, a, as, as, as those of you who might have been in the Rose Note, in, well, let me put this correctly, American English is not my native language, too. And if I get excited and go fast, I'll revert to my, closer to my native tongue, which is a variant of English, but just not a very standard one. And that gets a little harder to understand. So, okay, just slow me down. Okay, all right. So since that time, since the, certainly the, since the, Unclassed time, the, the, the treaty, 
and the, even the CLCS guidelines, the technology to map the seafloor, and the understand and the understanding of seafloor both morphology, the shape of the processes, has really changed radically, and we'll talk a lot about that tomorrow, why that really has to do with new mapping techniques. But even with all that new understanding, there's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty in how we interpret it. And that still leaves lots of room for arguments and interpretation. So it, again, it's just unresolved many of these issues. Okay, so Article 76 is all about the continental shelf. Well, I said it's the juridical continental shelf. I'm a geologist, a geophysicist. Oh, I should say, for what? I'm not alone. I have a, another scientific colleague. The colleague finally here, Clive. It's a pleasure to have another scientist. Usually I'm the lone I'm, scientist. I'm, I'm only semi scientific. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. He's a geographer. We, we, <laughs> but no, he's wonderful. wonderful, wonderful. Um, but the, the Clive, to me, when you said the continental shelf before Article 76, we know exactly what the continental shelf was. It's that flat part that goes from the beach to typically on a global average depth of about 130 meters. And it's a place where we get this, what we call the shelf break. It's finally a change of slope. Beyond that, we have what we call the continental slope, the much steeper part. And I warn you, you see these pictures like this, it's never really this steep. This is a picture of it with no what we call vertical exaggeration. This is what the real slopes would look like. And I'll fly it around a little later and you'll see, you'll see that. That's what, a, that's what a continental slope looks like. It's typically about two, three degrees, something like that at most. So it's very, very shallow. But you got to realize we're trying to show thousands of kilometers in one direction and just a, a few kilometers in another direction. So you've got to shove it together and you get this vertical exaggeration. So you don't see these big pictures like this, but this vertical exaggeration beyond the geologic continental shelf and the geologic continental slope, we have what we call the continental rise, that little area here. And then beyond that, what the geologists would call the abyssal plain or the deep sea. Okay? And to a geologist, that combination of the continental shelves, shelf, slope, geologic continental shelf, slope, and rise make up what we would call generically the continental margin. Okay? Now we jump into Article 76 and the audacity of the lawyers to change the definition. I do not know why. And I've asked people who were involved in the negotiations, why couldn't they use a different word? Why call it Jim, call it John, call it Clyde, call it something. But why use the same word that we geologists would know? It's very confusing is the bottom line, but they did, so we're stuck with it. So now we're going to define the juridical continental shell. Comprises the seabed and the subsoil of the submarine areas that extend beyond the territorial sea throughout the natural prolongation of the land territory. So we have this concept of natural prolongation, which all started in uh, the well, the North Slope, uh, North sea. North sea, the North Sea case, um, to the outer edge of the continental margin. So the continental shelf is defined as the outer edge of the continental margin, or to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baselines, if where the outer edge of the continental margin is, does not extend to that distance. So basically, every coastal state is entitled to 200 nautical miles, no matter what their continental margin looks like. But if their continental margin extends beyond it, your continental shelf will extend to the edge of the continental margin. Almost. Because the other thing I don't understand about law is everything is kind of pre-causal. You've got to wait, you've got to wait, you've got to wait. They don't say the good stuff up front. The good stuff comes later. <laughs> now we're going to define how much the continental margin. We're going to say that the continental shelf of a coastal state should not extend beyond the limits. So we said, well, you said it was the end of the continental margin, but we're going to give you some limits. They're going to be defined further on in paragraphs four to six. And now we're going to start saying the continental margin comprises the submerged prolongation. Again, this concept of natural prolongation of land mass. And it consists of the seabed and subsoil of the shelf. Which shelf is that? <laughs> no, no it's, it's, it is the kind, but it's a geologic shelf. And I'm talking about the juridical shelf. This is the geological shelf. The geologic slope, the first picture I showed you, and the continental rise. Remember that shell slope and rise? So I was saying that makes up the continental margin. Kind of just like the geologists look like it. The geologic shelf, the geologic slope, the geologic rise. It doesn't include the deep ocean floor or its oceanic ridges or the subsoil thereof. So what we call the abyssal plain is excluding all that and the features on that. So there we go again. Remember the geologic continental shelf, the geologic slope. The geologic rise that makes up the continental margin, as described. Yeah. It, it does 
slope is not that inclined. How you, where do you um, defer when the slope pinches and the rest of that's a great question. That is what we call the flip of the slope, which is going to be the fundamental feature that we're going to look for, and we'll take a look at that. Because as the continental slope is not as steep, the continental rise is not that steep either. So this relationship of slopes thing is just much, much less. So we'll see. But this is one of the fundamental issues because, again, in the 1970s and 1980s, it was this kind of primitive picture of what the deep sea floor looked like, what the ocean continental margins looked like that the authors of the treaty had. And what we'll learn a little bit today, mostly tomorrow, is that this is not what it looks like at all. It's much, much more complicated, unfortunately. Okay, so the margin is the submerged prolongation of the shelf slope that rise and excludes the deep ocean floor and oceanic ridges. Now, when we uh, talk, start talking about the juridical, the legal continental shelf, it can actually extend as we'll see, right out to the deep sea in some cases. So it's much, much different than that geologic continental shelf we have. Okay, so we have that, that fundamental difference. Okay, remember we said we're going to define how far the continental shelf and the continental margin go in paragraphs four through six. Well, here we go with paragraph four. For the purposes of this convention, the coastal state shall establish the outer edge of its continental margin. So we're going to start by defining the edge of the continental margin wherever it extends beyond, so if we're beyond 200 nautical miles. And we're going to have two different ways of defining that extent of the continental margin. The first is a line <coughs> delineated, delineated in accordance with paragraph 7. And paragraph 7 just says that we can connect points with straight lines 60, up to 60 nautical miles long. If you don't have to worry too much, it's just a way to connect some points. By reference to the outermost fixed points, each of which, at each of which, the thickness of the sedimentary rock <coughs> is at least 1% of the shortest distance back from such a point to the foot of the continental slope. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> Don't worry about it right now. I'll come back and I'll show you a picture. Okay? This is going to be another way, but just whatever it means, it's, re it's relevant to the foot of the continental slope. It's just the question you were asking. Okay? There's a second way to define the limit of the continental margin. <coughs> a line delineated in accordance with paragraph 7 by reference to the fixed points, not more than 60 nautical miles from the foot of the continental slope. That one's a little simpler, but we still have to find the foot of the slope. The foot of the slope is the key to everything in terms of extending the continental margin. And then they haven't told us what the foot of the slope is, but finally, in paragraph B here, for B, we get the definition of the foot of the slope, and in typical legal, how can I say this nicely, weasel, weaselness, or ambiguity, trade of ambiguity, maybe is the word, you start off everything. In the absence of evidence to the contrary, well, that gives you a lot of, a lot of slack. The foot of the continental slope shall be determined as the point of maximum change in gradient. That's the first thing that's precise. I can calculate what the maximum change in gradient is. It's a simple mathematical function, second derivative. But they again offer some wiggle room at its base. And so it's not just the point of maximum change in gradient, it's at the base of the slope. And what we'll see, and I think what the commission has seen, is that many of their discussions have to do with where a coastal state defines where the base of the slope is. And that's done not just by the morphology, it's done by geologic processes. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. We'll see examples of that tomorrow. Okay, so in this nice exaggerated picture, geologic continental shelf, geologic slope, geologic rise, the deep sea or the plain, the foot of the slope is the point where there's the maximum change in rate. And again, that's what the authors of the, of the convention have in mind. That kind of picture of what a continental margin looks like. So let's look at it kind of more three-dimensionally. We have our geologic continental shelf, in this case extending beyond 200 nautical miles. We have our continental slope. We have our continental rise and then the deep sea out here. What I want to point out here is this wedge here, this yellow. This is the center. What was Article 76 really all about? Anybody know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Why? Who cares? Why do you care about the continental shelf? Resources. What resources? Mineral uh, resources, particularly. Oil and gas. There's all about oil and gas. And how do you make oil? How do you make oil? Well, you need, well, you need carbon. You need, that comes from little microorganisms that live in the surface of the ocean and they die and they fall to the bottom. And then what else do you need? You need to cook it, heat, you need time, and you need pressure. And you need a way to trap it too. And where does that happen? That happens in these thick wedges of sediment. You have to have kilometers and kilometers of sediment in an area where there's productivity to make oil and gas. And that happens on the continental margins in these very thick sediments. The thicker the sediment, the more chance there's going to be that there's oil and gas. And this is why there was this big fight between the broad margin states who had these large continental margins and the narrow margin states who had very narrow lines and not much oil and gas potential. Well, the broad market states, they wanted to be able to extend their sovereign rights to what they considered their, nat their natural prolongation of resources. And that was what Article 76 was all about. That's why it was 10 years of negotiation. The margineers. The margineers, yeah. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're one of them. Yeah. Not you. <laughs> Your grandparents. I have a high Okay, so, so it's this thick wedge of sediment that had all the oil and gas resources. And so what Article 76 was all about was those nations that had wide shelves wanted to be able to extend their rights, their sovereign rights to resources beyond just killing compromise because their resources, they intended to continue that way naturally, natural prolongation. The first way to determine where that was, they didn't quite know. You had the very, very primitive mapping of the seashore at that time, and there was a, a famous oil company geologist, uh, uh, Howard, Hedberg um, worked for Shell Oil Company, and he probably knew more about the deep sea floor than almost anybody, and knew about, more about oil resources than anybody. And he basically said, "Well, you know, I know there's a stick wedge of sediment, and if you get to about the foot of the slope, you're probably in, at the end of where the sediment is going to be thick enough to give you those resources. So let's just say go on 60 nautical miles, and then we're we're covered." And so that was the first. Proposal for how you establish the end of the continental margin. What are the slope of 60 nautical miles? Okay? And I'm going to go backwards because I'm going to start with the simple one, which is this one. That's This is what we call the Hedberg line. Or the, uh, yeah, the Hedberg line, let's just call it that. So a line you in the courts of Congress set by reference to fixed points, not more than 60 nautical miles from the foot of the continental slope. So there we are at the foot of the slope, and this one's pretty simple once we found the foot of the slope. The big issue is finding the foot of the slope, and then we move 60 nautical miles, and we've, just, we've established, what have we established at this point? The, the edge of what? The continental margin, not the continental slope, the continental margin. That's right. Okay. But what happened a few years later is everybody was looking at their continental margins, the Irish. No offense. No. <laughs> the Irish came along. I'm not, I'm not a friend of this. Uh, you should be very proud, because it was, it was right. A fellow named Gardner came along, and he said, you know, if I apply this formula to my margin, I get screwed. We're, we have a lot more resources, but it just, doesn't, it just doesn't work for us. So he proposed a second approach, what he called the Gardner line, or the sediment thickness line, and he said, what I want to do is this one, a line delineated in accordance with paragraph 7 reference to the outermost fixed points, and each of which the thickness of the sedimentary rocks is at least 1% of the shortest distance from such a point to the foot of the continental slope. Very complicated, very complicated to do, and we'll see tomorrow how we actually go ahead and do that. But uh, the bottom line is it starts again at the foot of the slope. The foot of the slope is the key to it so much. And then now we're going to look at the thickness of those sediments. And so here again is our beach, the coastline. Here's that wedge of sediment. We have the, the geologic Continental shelf, the slope, the rise, the deep sea out here. Don't worry about what's here. I'll talk about this in a few minutes. But that thick wedge of sediment, it's kilometers thick here. They're showing six kilometers. Many places off the east coast of the US, it's 12 to 20 kilometers thick. Sri Lanka has a usually thick one. Lots of places, very thick sediment, great prospects for oil and gas. And so what Gardner said is, I want to find the foot of the slope again. There it is here. And now I'm going to look at where that sediment thins to 1% of the distance back to the foot of the slope. So 
if the sediment is four and a half kilometers thick here, that's it, right at the foot of the slope. If I move out here, say 100 kilometers from the foot of the slope, here the sediment's about three and a half kilometers thick, so it's way more than 1%. I can keep going, I can keep going, I can keep going, until at this point, I am now 200 kilometers from the foot of the slope, and the sediment is two kilometers thick. So at that point, he said, it's thin enough that I probably don't have oil and gas. You need more than that to make oil and gas. So that was just a second approach to doing it. And so you apply that formula, and in this case, just in this imaginary case, we apply the, the sediment thickness formula. Looking at the thickness of sediment, we find all the points where the sediment thickness is 1% of the distance back of the foot of the slope. And so we have two different approaches for establishing the limit of the continental margin. The sediment thickness approach and the Hepburn line. What we can do is use either one to our advantage, whichever is to our advantage. So we can mix and match it, we can combine them. So in this case, which is most advantageous, the Hepburn line, we'll use that. Okay. And then you can switch over to the sediment thickness line. And so there we have it. That's the edge of our edge of our line. Continental margin. That's the edge of the continental margin. We're still in paragraph four. We're not going to define the edge of the continental shelf until paragraph five, because we have to apply paragraph five to now define the edge of the continental shelf. So paragraph five is going to say, well, we've gone through this to define the edge of the continental margin, but we're going to constrain you a little. We're going to put two different limit lines up for you. We're going to say that the outer limits of the continental shelf now shall either shall not exceed 350 nautical miles from the baselines. That's the only really simple one, just a simple measure. Well, not simple, it's called a, a geodetic measure. I think it's really good. A geodetic measure means that it's a measurement on a sphere, so you can't just kind of take your Mercator projection and so it's a little complicated measure. 350 nautical miles from the baselines or shall not exceed 100 nautical miles from the 2,500 meter isobath. An isobath is a line of constant depth. We call it the contour, the 2,500 meter contour. It's 2,500 meters deep. So what do we do? We've now, in paragraph four, define the edge of the continental margin. Now we apply the limit lines. The first one is we find where it's 2,500 meters deep and go 100 nautical miles. And so what happens in this case? Here, the edge of the continental margin is within the limit. So we can use that. But here, the edge of the continental margin exceeds the limit line, so we can't use that, so we'd have to go there. If that was the only limit line. But of course, just to make it complicated, we have two limit lines. So we apply the other one too. The simple one, just measure 350 nautical miles from the baselines. And we look which is the best in all cases. So in this case, the 350 nautical mile line, which is this different colors on my machine. Okay, different color than that, but that's the 350 line. That's where the 2,500 plus 100 nautical mile limit line was. That's where the continental margin was, so we can use all that just fine. So that's the edge of our continental shelf. In here, we're constrained in between the two. We have to, the outer, the continental margin is beyond the limits, but we'll use the furthest limit, which will be the 2,500 meter line. In here, the continental margin goes well, that's the, yeah, the continental margin is out here, so we'll use the, like, the 350 nautical mile line, and here we'll pop over to the actual continental margin line. So at the end of the day, you put it all together. Don't worry, you're not going to be asked to do this. Try to do this for you. He's got, he's got the software to do it for you. And that's in, in each of your cases. There'll, there'll be people, there's software out there that, that tries to do this, but it's, it's really critical that you guys understand what's behind this because at the end of the day, the real arguments over is where the foot of the slope is and what the kind of crust is and what the oceanic crust is. And that's in each of your countries, you'll have to defend it. Yeah. Well, I don't understand this because, but if you, like, so you're trying to measure and put them into you combined or to the convenience in it, order it, to. Whichever is to your advantage, yeah. Exactly. And, and I, I turn to my legal friends because it doesn't really ever say that. It doesn't, it just says or. It doesn't say and or. It says or. And every time I've asked, people say, well, it's just accepted. 
That's what I'm trying to tell you now also. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So you use always the farthest limit? Whatever is most to your advantage. Yeah, sure. I mean, we, actually, there, there is a case now. It's really interesting. Cuba did not. In, in, we're in the midst of a negotiation with Cuba now. And for some reason, I mean, we don't know why yet, they did not use the farthest. They used the, you can use whatever you want. It's, it's your choice. But they chose not to use the farther one. Fine. Larry, you, you emphasize that the, the foot of the slope is key. Mm -hmm. Great. Evidence to the, to the contrary. What yeah. arguments oh, we'll get there. will fit into that? We'll, 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 we'll get there. Yeah. 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 There, there, there really is only... Uh, let, let me go through the... Let me go through the... Explain the oceanic and crustal... The best we can all derive, figure out, and just like legal scholars have to figure out what was meant by... We think that was what, what was meant by evidence of the contrary was looking at the transition between ocean and continental crust. If there is no clear foot of the slope. That, that's one interpretation. If you can't find a clear foot of the slope, there was lots of arguments. The English came back and said, it's how you read it, that little definition. The absence of evidence to the contrary, they actually thought the evidence to the contrary was the most important thing. Most people read it as secondary the evidence to the contrary, and I think that's the way the commission has, has interpreted it. Um, so the commission basically says, if you can't find the clear foot of the slope, then you fall back on evidence to the contrary. Um, and we'll talk about what that is. And most of the thought is it's where the oceanic and continental crust is, but we haven't told them what oceanic and continental crust is yet. We'll do that in a few minutes. So then we'll come back to that. So, so hold, hold that point. Okay, Larry. Just one question there on the sediment thickness. I mean, the projection there is, uh, shows a certain uniformity in relation to sediment thickness, mm -hmm. which, you know, if it projects seaward uh, on the projection, it looks less and less, but of course, sediment thickness can be. Yep, no, that's absolutely right. The whole world is much more complicated than these early notions. The early notions were that the continent, the sediment comes from the continent. That's what the mountains erode. They build that big sediment pile, so they should be thickest right next to the margin, and should thin as you go away. There are many cases where it's just the opposite, and the U.S. has many examples of that, where it actually gets thicker as you move away. So, and and it doesn't just uniformly do it. So it's it's, it's very complicated. But let's leave it at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So if you thought that was complicated, <clears throat> paragraph six comes along. And any, any paragraph that starts with notwithstanding, you know, you have to be in trouble. So notwithstanding the provisions of paragraph five, paragraph five is the limit for provisions on submarine ridges, totally undefined. So submarine ridges, the limit of the continental shelf shall not exceed 350 miles a mile. So it says on um, whatever submarine ridges are, you can't use either or in paragraph 5, you can only use the 350 miles in it. This paragraph does not apply to submarine elevations that are natural components of the continental margin, such as plateaus, rises, caps, banks, and spurs. Again, submarine elevation is not defined. So it says if it's a submarine elevation, not a submarine ridge, and the key to the submarine elevation is that it's a natural component of the continental margin, whatever that means, again, undefined, then you can use either of the two paragraph five limits. So here we are summarizing that on submarine highs. We have from paragraph three, oceanic ridges of the deep ocean floor are excluded by paragraph three from generating continental shelves. So you cannot do anything from them. They're part of the deep sea. Submarine ridges, whatever they are, have a maximum limit of 350 nautical miles. And submarine elevations that are natural components of the continental margin, the standard limits apply 350 miles or 2,500 meters plus 100 nautical miles. And that was, I think, originally, I'm so sure, but originally put in there as we look at how oceanic bridges form around the, uh, around the ocean, stopping some nations that sit on top of oceanic bridges from claiming the entire world. I think that was the, the theory behind it, but there are other parts of the treaty that I think override it. It's to stop those perfidious ice hunters. Yeah, I, I, do, I would, yeah. usually Thomas is not here when I talk about this. Right down the Atlantic Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, show, I'll show that in a minute. Okay, this ridge issue, this paragraph six was so complicated that when the commissioners 
wrote their technical and scientific guidelines, even they couldn't figure it out. And they basically kind of what we call numerical hunted and, and said, uh, we'll figure this out on a case by case basis, basically what they said. You know, we'll just look at everything and figure it out. They really, they really couldn't, because, because there were so many things not defined. Okay, so Article 76 has all of this geologic terminology. None of it really clearly defined. But really the key issues, the really ambiguous and important ones, are where the foot of the cotton slope is, not the change in gradient. You can calculate that mathematically, but where do you define the base of the cotton slope? And this issue of slide brought up, brought up of evidence to the contrary, and again, I'll, I'll come back to that. And then the issue with bridges. Oceanic bridges, submarine bridges, and submarine elevations. How do you distinguish them? Because again, nothing is defined as there. So to summarize all that, if the continental margin extends beyond 200 nautical miles, the middle of the continental shelf is determined by a set of formula and limit lines that are defined by the depth and the shape of the seafloor. In particular, where the foot of the slope is and where the 2,500 meter contour is in terms of depth. The thickness of the sediment, which is defined by that 1% line, the Gardner line. Distances from the territorial sea baselines, the 350 nautical mile line. And there's a bit more complexity on submarine ridges. Okay, so again, you guys aren't probably going to be called upon to do these calculations or the people who do it for you, but I think it's important to understand the context because Article 76, um, it has a tremendous ramification for many, many coastal states. But the bottom line is, because of all that, to do that, you have to map the seafloor. And that's why people like me are involved with this because I'm a mapper. So in, in most coastal states, there are folks who have to go out and do this mapping. This is just an example of it's a tremendous effort in many places where you go out and you first determine the baselines, but we're going to determine the and collect all kinds of data to determine the shape and the size of it. So we'll talk about how we do that tomorrow. And I mean, this, it's, it's hard to actually capture this because we've had so many repeat submissions and things like that. I try to capture, I think we're at numbers like this, about 168 parties to the treaty, 77 of eight submissions to the CLCS. There are a lot of preliminary submissions which kind of stop the 10-year clock. There's a 10-year clock after the session to the treaty, the ratification of the treaty. You have 10 years to make your submissions, but the partial submissions, the preliminary submissions were, were a way for nations that haven't been able to, to mount the effort to kind of stop the clock. Uh, 24 so far have received recommendations. The first ones took several years each. Um, we figured that if, was, if the U.S. would ever actually exceed and put a submission in in the next few years, it would be 2030 or so until they would, until the commission would get to us. And I think four states have received, uh, have actually, and this came up in one of the earlier lectures, um, nothing is final and binding just by the recommendations. All the commission can do is make recommendations. It has to be the coastal state that declares its outer limits. And you do that by depositing those limits with the Secretary General. And if they're based on the recommendations of the CLCS, then they're considered final and binding. I think they're, is that true? I think there are only four of those right now. Nobody's saying no. So. I, I just believe it then until the proof drop. Check, you can check out the Wallace website. They have a list of all of them. But, but it's really hard because you get your repeats of a, a nation make a, re, a coastal state making a resubmission and things like that. OK, so that was. The kind of geologic background of Article 76, and I think we'll hear more about it. Thomas, you're going to talk about it from a much more a legal context, and hopefully this complements that. I hope. Yeah, no, I, I will repeat many of the things you've done because I, I think this it's is so one of the most complex issues in the world. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, it, it can't be repeated enough. <laughs> um, you know, I, I said I had to sit down. I had to read the treaty cold, and, and I had to read Article 76 about a hundred times till I actually understood, thought I was, and I'm still not sure I fully understand what it says. Okay, what I want to do now is sort of take a step back and tell you from the geologic side where things like oceanic and continental crust comes from. If we have time, we can come back to five questions about evidence to the contrary. So where, where does the world come from? Right? The, you know, the, the ocean and the continents and all that. And um, how many people have uh, I've seen the Big Bang Theory, the TV show? Mm -hmm. no? Not many? Oh. Okay, well, that explains it all right there. So, 13.7 uh, billion years ago. Okay, so 
Right, right, right. <laughs> so the bottom, the bottom line was about 14 million years ago. And don't ask me why. And this is where you can call back for those of us who are religious to say something. There was this phenomenal cosmic event. The Big Bang, as it's called, particles were created. And as particles were created with phenomenal forces, they were thrown out in the universe. This is kind of in the universe. And things began to coalesce. Clouds of particles began to gather together, spinning with tremendous energy. Concentrating material, concentrating material. Running it up, it says it's running up, it's running, just running slowly. We're creating the universe a little more slowly than, uh, but it took a long time. Because about this one, the solar system, the Earth's solar system was formed because these materials separated, separated, separated the planets. And that happened about, anybody know how long ago that was? Four, yeah, that's where it is. 4.3, 4.4 billion years ago. And we separated into this whole detonation. Four, you know, no longer. So we only have eight planets now. A little planet total. It'll always be a planet in my heart. So all this stuff kind of separated out. And when things separate out, I don't know, you guys are probably too young for B 52s. Anybody had a, a yeah. B 52? Uh, there you go. You know what a B 52 is. This is a drink. We put all these alcohols of different density. Yeah, they kind of stratify out. So you know, the denser stuff stays on the bottom, lighter, lighter, lighter. It kills when you drink. But that's, that's the way the world works. Things separate out based on their density. And so the, the planets started to separate out all that material. Well, within the planets then, they too started to separate out their material. And if we look at the Earth, the Earth separated out. The Earth is about 6,400 kilometers to the center of the Earth. The center of the Earth is actually made of solid nickel and iron. How do you know that? Nobody's been there. You know, the movies, so many movies. And Jules Verne said he was there, but not true. How do we know what the center of the Earth is? Perfectly, yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, so, so seismic, well, actually the best is it, it often has the nuclear blasts and earthquakes generate big waves through the Earth. And they, you can track them, and depending on their speed and how fast they go and how they bend, you can actually try to derive or invert the information. And so we have an idea of the inner core of the Earth is solid, the nickel and iron, and there's an outer li liquid core of the same kind of metal type stuff, but all liquid. Tremendous, as you can imagine, pressure. Geothermal gradient, 10 to 60 degrees per kilometer. How many people have been in a mine, just go to the mine, it's a few kilometers down, and already it's stifling hot because 10 to 60 degrees per kilometer, but this is 6,300 kilometers. So you can imagine the temperatures and the pressures down there. So things separated out on density, by density, but also the final thin little layer on the top separated out too. And that's what we call the Earth's crust. And it separated out into different materials. Um, so 4.3 billion years ago, the Earth formed. We had that differentiation internally, but also externally. And the continental material, which is the lighter material, <coughs> separated out from oceanic material, which is the denser material. And let's take a look at those properties right here. And what we see is continent material. And you can look at its properties. I think all should have these slides. You should. You don't really know. When you see typically the continents 30 to 50 kilometers thick, the continental crust, this says granite, it's just it's, it's geologically light, it's pink, just think of it as pink, light stuff. The oceanic crust, much thinner, 5 to 12 kilometers thick, it's made of what we call basalt, much denser. And so the dense stuff stays lower than the light stuff, which floats. We have kind of a semi-liquid plastic material. This is floating out. We call a mantle. And the continents stand much higher. The average height of the continents, anybody know? I don't know. 325. No, but I think it's, about, it's closer to probably 1,000 meters, I think, would be the average continent height. Average depth of the ocean? That one, I know. 3,000 meters. 3,000 meters. So it's a 4,000 meter difference, and that's just because of the difference in the density. Well, when you have that difference in the density, high stuff standing and low stuff sitting here, and you start generating through all this kind of cosmic formation stuff, water. Where's the water going to go? Into the low places. So we make oceans too. So because the oceanic crust is more dense, 
And since lower, we fill the oceans with water, and we have this kind of structure. And this comes back to what uh, Fernando was talking about today, that remember I said there was this geothermal gradient, 10 to 60 degrees per kilometer, getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and it's, a lot of that's catching that initial energy of formation of the solar system, and also some of the just radioactive materials that are down there, but tremendous heat down there. And that heat starts, where does heat go? Heat always rises, right? And so it's trying to rise from the center of the Earth, um, and it doesn't do it evenly. It comes up in some places and then cools, and we get these things called convection cells, so we have an uneven heat coming up in some places and coming down in others. You get this circulation of, of, of temperature, and this starts actually breaking up the continents, breaking up the continental crust and the oceanic crust, creating something we call plate tectonics. And so it looks like this. We have heat rising up in a certain place. This happens to be in the middle of an oceanic crust. And so what happens when heat rises up in the middle of an oceanic crust? We have ice living. Yeah. Or ridge crust. A ridge crust is formed, and if you do it enough, Iceland is the ultimate, the ultimate um, expulsion of the, uh, I'll just leave it as ultimate, of magma. Volcanism. Volcan yeah, yeah, volcanism. Yeah, that's how volcanoes would happen. So we have that, and it actually splits the crust, and that convection cell will start moving the crust away on one side, away on the other. We'll start the ablation here, and we'll see what happens. And so we have heat coming up, splitting the crust, creating new crust at that point, and moving it, moving it along. It can't go on forever. Eventually it cools down and gets dense. The hot crust is light. But as it cools down, the new crust is light. As it cools down, it gets heavier. And it will eventually, what we call subduct, it will move down either under another continent, because it, it, it can never Confidence of light, so it's got to go under the continent. Sometimes it'll subduct in an oceanic plate, too. We'll see that in a minute, too. Okay, so we have this plate tectonic thing. So that first creation of the giant separation of continents, now through time, hundreds of millions of years, has broken up the continents and moved them and moved them and moved them. And this is, again, what we call plate tectonics. Coming back to what Fernando talked about this morning, those places where the ridge crests are forming, where the heat's coming up, that's where we have the hydrothermal, hydrothermal vents, for the most part, and the mineralization for the most part. There are places called cold vents, but for the most part, the big exciting ones, the black smokers, are the hydrothermal vents. And as Rand said, when, when this was first discovered in the 1970s, again, vents didn't know about it at all. Um, it basically changed our understanding of the original life, because these were life forms that don't use photosynthesis, they don't use sun. Until that time, we thought all life on life Earth depended on it, depended on life. If you have a whole ecosystem that survive on chemical energy. Okay? Go on. So now, we have this picture of, of the plates. Here's one of our ridge crests. This is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So you can see the ridge crest coming down, down, down. A little offset, but let's move up to Iceland. So you see how Iceland sits right on the ridge crest there. But it's this massive, massive profusion of lava. And you can see why and the Azores also associated with the ridge crest. But you can see why the authors of the convention said, if I would draw a 2,500 meter contour, potentially it can go, nobody really knew, it could potentially go all around on the ridge crest. So if you're going to do a limit to the continental shelf without using both of them, Iceland, if it could use a 2,500 meter plus 100 mile limit line, it could come along, follow the ridge, 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 the ridge goes on, and if I pick it up on the other side of the Pacific, and the bottom line is the ridge crest circum. The world. And so I think it was to prevent Iceland from taking over the world. <laughs> it's like that original. Uh, but you, you heard of the foot of slope, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And, and, and actually, I'm, I'm, I'm very supportive, as you know, of, of the Iceland.
has some position in this, but, but I think that was, remember, in the early days, there was just very limited understanding of what was going on uh, in the sea, uh, on the seafloor. Okay, so we have those ridges, which are we see now today all over, and trenches, too. And so uh, here was the kind of trench I showed you before, where the, the ridges here of the East Pacific Rise, it's pushing, it's pushing crust in this direction, and it's now subducting beneath Central and South America. We see the continent standing way high, and this is real bathymetry data now. This is not a, just a made-up picture. This is, this is based on real bathymetry. And we see the, the deep trench here where, where that oceanic crust is subducting. I also mentioned there were oceanic trenches in the middle of the ocean, and they always form islands behind them. And so we look at most of the Pacific, the, 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 the ring of fire out here, all these trenches. That, there's a trench there. The deepest, where's the deepest place in the world? Right now? Yeah, yeah, trench. So it seemed like it's, <clears throat> it, uh, yeah, so like it's right there. Yeah. And there it is. Yeah, about, well, it goes down. Anybody know the depth? Five. Five. Ten thousand nine hundred ninety-four. I know, because we mentioned it. We'll see that tomorrow. Um, yeah, and so that's a deep spot. So that's an ocean, ocean trench. Okay, let's get off this. Back here. Okay. Well. Once this was determined, these processes, and this was evolving through the 80s and up to the mid-90s, understanding suddenly all kinds of things fell in place. If you look at where earthquakes take place around the world, look at this distribution of earthquakes. It's quite remarkable. What it's doing is outlining the plates. These are the plates, a big Pacific plate, a lot of little plates around here, the North American plate, the European plate, and that it's basically the ridge crest, because every time volcano magma comes up in a volcano, we, that's a little earthquake. The little earthquakes take place on the ridge crest, and the big super earthquakes take place at the subduction zone. We have huge movement of crust against each other. And so suddenly, this picture of plate tectonics started explaining things. It was basically marching mentioned the outer uh, edges of the plates. We were able to start putting together pictures of what the place, plates are doing. Uh, so that's what it was 200 million years ago. If we start looking in time, we'll see things, how they evolved 100 million years ago, 30, 50 million years ago, and today. Let's go back to today, like this. But we can predict where things are going. And so if I push it ahead into the future, 50 million years or so, that's what it looks like. You can hardly see the gray. The bottom line is, don't own property in northern India. Because <laughs> look what happens to northern India here. I'll move it back down. You see it? And Australia is going to get up with target. So now you know where to invest if you have a long term. <laughs> okay. 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 Okay, and again, it just starts putting lots of things into context. Iceland, as we said, is kind of ground zero. You can walk into Fingalir, the place of the original assemblies, a thousand years ago, and you can put your hand on the European plate, and your hand, walk over and put your hand on the North American plate. It's a geologist paradise, but that's a rich place that's really kind of come up. Um, to the surface. Even more interesting, if we go to East Africa, the whole series of lakes along East Africa are a new ridge crest being formed. There's a continent being split right today. And that's what the lakes are. The lakes are because things are pulled apart and they're being filled with fresh water now. Eventually it will open up and move further and further apart. So we have Continent being split right now, the Red Sea is about a million years ahead, two million years ahead. That's already split, and we have now very salty water in there. So we see the evolution, which is happening over and over again. Now, with respect to Article 76, it's really this picture that uh, authors of the convention have in mind. A continent is split, oceanic crust, deep oceanic crust there, that dense oceanic crust forms, sediment 
the sediments are eroded and filling in on the sides, and we get a picture like this. We call this a passive margin. This is what the Atlantic is about. Most of that treaty was written about that. Um, that you have that. Again, you'll see that profile, the shelf, the slope, the rise, but the sediments eroding, filling that, making that wedge. Okay, so that was the picture that they got. It looks like this still, maybe it's easier to see it still. We, we send one of those blooms to magma up. We start making a rich rest. We separate the two sides. That would be Ireland, that would be my house over there in New Hampshire, and sediment coming from eroding, the thick sediment coming there, the oil and the gas being formed there, and we end up with this transition from oceanic crust somewhere into, excuse me, from continental crust somewhere into oceanic crust. And we end up with a profile like that, with the continental shelf, continental slope, the continental rise, and the other supply. But it's this transition from continental crust that was split into oceanic crust that was created. This is coming back to Clive's question, what probably was intended by evidence to the contrary, that is the ultimate separation of the continent from the ocean. The problem is geophysically, the kind of techniques I'll describe, it's very, very, very difficult to find. You can't see it. It's, it's not a sharp boundary at all. It's a very diffuse boundary. Very difficult to find. But what, at least my term, what is meant by evidence to the contrary is if you cannot identify a clear maximal change in gradient, you're allowed to fall back on uh, evidence to the contrary and you can use geophysical evidence to look at where the continental oceanic crust boundaries. There has been only one submission that's used evidence to the contrary, it's Argentina, and I think they got positive on that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, so rumors, I don't know when rumors become reality. So, yeah. Uh, well, they personally, but it was a group, so, yeah, yeah, uh, it, so, so that's the first and only. So it's very, very rarely invoked. We've had how many seventy something recommendations, uh, seventy seventy something submissions. Only one has used them. Used them. That's my old. That's my not standing no, used. What? Yes. Oh no, it was a very small part. It was a very small part of, of the submission. So so that's that's the story. and that's where this idea of this shelf small is. Okay, so that comes back to now you should understand where this came from, where the sediments came from, the sediment wedge, and how that abyssal plane of the deep sea is that oceanic crust that sits much lower. But all that was pictures and cartoons of you know, what people thought happened. What I'm going to come to tomorrow is we're going to look at real data, we're going to look at how we go out and map that. And the bottom line, a little sneak preview, when we go out and in tremendous detail we have now to be able to map. Look at this is the Atlantic, which was really the, the, the type section. This is what the, this is what the authors of the convention had in mind. But you tell me where's that? This is going to break back to your question. Where's where's the base of the slope there? Where's the foot of the slope there? Very very difficult to find morphologically, just on the shape. And what we have to call upon then is other processes, <coughs> geologic processes, and start thinking about. We'll talk about this tomorrow. What are the processes of the slope versus the processes of the rise that might separate them? We'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, I just want to end by saying that I showed you the what we call the passive margin, the kind of Atlantic margin. This is a picture of what happens in the Pacific, um, where we have uh, trenches, or wherever there's a trench. This is an oceanic continental trench. We're subducting the deep continental crust. Looks like that. What we tend to do is when we do that, the friction of that oceanic plate going beneath the <coughs> continental plate, the friction, that creates heat. And what's heat do? It melts the rocks, it creates volcanoes. volcanoes. And that's why the Andes are there. We call that, that actually is a rock type, we call andesitic material. So we get big, big mountains, typically at the edge of the trench, because we create volcanoes. But we can all, that's that, and that's the picture I just showed you there. And we call that a Chilean type of trench, where the oceanic plate, plate comes under. These mountains are the result of, these are all volcanoes, the result of that friction. So we can also have an ocean ocean subduction or convergence, where out in the middle of the oceanic plate, we do that. And then again, the friction now creates islands, and call these island arcs. So the Philippines and Indonesia, all these kind of islands are the result of that subduction, and that's why the big earthquakes are there. The meat, the oceanic crust creating these island chains, Japan, the same thing. So the Mar Mariana type trench. So we have the big subduction and islands behind. Subduction here and islands behind. Okay.
Okay? So, and, and in all honesty, the, the, certainly the authors of the convention knew nothing about that at the time. The CLCS knew a little about it, but mostly they were thinking of this capital land, passive margin, what we call it. And coming back to what Fernando was talking about, when we get this kind of organization, this becomes a huge place, particularly in what we call back arc basins, because typically behind one of these trenches, Oceanic trenches, you get the islands, and then you get a little basin, a new ocean being formed. Marianas we call back arc basin, and great, great place for making mass of sulfur. There's a lot of great mass of sulfur deposits there. Okay, so coming back to that typical cross section of the ocean again. Shelf slope rise, um, you can see the ridge crest in the middle, shelf slope rise, or slope up, or up the way. That's the form of it. What's happening in the water column up here? As you said, there's all this sediment being, this is the oil and gas stuff that's come from the continent. The mountain being eroded, filling in there, all the stuff coming in, filling in there. Lots of good oil and gas territory. But what about in the middle? What's happening? What's covering all the seafloor? If, if we didn't know any more, the seafloor should all be made of that black stuff I talked about, the salt, the oceanic crust. But it's not. For the most part, if we go sample on the seafloor, it's soft sediment. But it's not the same kind of sediment that's sitting here. That's what we call the big word, terrigenous sediment. That sediment that came from the continents. The sediment out here is what we call pelagic sediment. It comes from the water column itself. It comes from all these little zillions of microorganisms some animals and some plants, zooplankton and microplankton, so, yeah, that live, or phytoplankton, that live in the surface waters in the photic zone where there's light and everything. They only live for about two weeks. They're tiny little microscopic things. They have a hard skeleton, either made of calcium carbonate, calcite, or made out of silica. And then they fall to the bottom. And so most of the bottom of the seafloor here is now covered by these pelagic sediments. And this is what some of these little critters look like, these little bugs that make up the seafloor. And this is not actually what the bug looks like. This is its skeleton. These skeletons have a, a little cytoplasm. They're actually quite beautiful, a little cytoplasm uh, covering it. If you go around any of the oceanographic <coughs> institutes, you'll see all these people who wear thick glasses because they've spent all their lives looking at microscopes <laughs> trying to identify these. But these are usually uh, useful. You see what it says here? Tropical, warm, and subtropical. Certain species live in different climates. So you can go down into the sediment and understand what the climate was like through history by looking at them. So we have these, uh, these uh, little skeletons. And so if you look at the world ocean, the terrigenous sediment, the stuff that comes from the continent, the brown stuff, that's what Article 76 was really all about. That's the oil and gas stuff. So you see where those are, about the chemical margins. And then you have the rest of it is this pelagic stuff made out of silica um, or carbonate. Not Really much economic use for them. The, the, some of the some of the silica stuff is used in filters, diatomaceous earth filters, but really not much economic value for them in their present state. But sitting on top of the places where the sedimentation rate is very low are the what you call them potatoes. The, uh, well, I see. I was calling them baseball. American <laughs> American <laughs> <Mangan's laughs> which through time have fostered lots and lots of interest um, up and down in the 1970s. I'll take the last minute to, to tell the story, which shows how careful we have to be. There was a huge boom, many, many companies building huge systems to mine manganese nodules. And the reason they were doing it was because Howard Hughes, I don't know if you remember Howard Hughes, Howard Hughes, a super billionaire, um, had built a giant ship to mine manganese nodules. And all these other companies, big companies like Lockheed and things like that, Alcoa, they all said, wow, if Howard Hughes is doing it, this must be right. And so they all spent hundreds of millions of dollars building these big ships. As a graduate student, I was supported by research on manganese nodules because everybody was talking about manganese nodules in the 1970s. And it turns out that the ship that Howard Hughes built was a cover for the CIA to recover a sunken Russian submarine. <laughs> and so it would go out to the Pacific, and, and everybody thought it was ma mining mang manganese nodules, and it was really recovering a Russian submarine. But in the meantime, all these other companies came along and started to develop technology 
technologies, but it just wasn't economically viable. And it probably still isn't. And it's really the copper probably is. It, it really depends on the price of minerals. I mean, you you had the Chris Brown was here. Did you talk about all this stuff? So, so I don't I don't need to say, say more about it. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. 